This is Fam Electric Ghost, and we are live on our Twitch, YouTube, Facebook channels with Kevin Stratton. We're very excited to have him on the air for the first time. And um, we've been a podcaster since 2018. This year, we transitioned into video podcasting, and we're really excited to be talking to a, to a man like Kevin. And you're going to find out why in the next hour. So, welcome to the show, Kevin. Thank you. Should I call you Keith or Phantom Ghost? Well, Phantom Electric Ghost is my full name, or PEG is the acronym. But uh, yeah, you can call me Keith. <laughs> or you call me. You could call me Josephine. Like, how you doing? I'm Josephine Electric. <laughs> I'm the lead singer of the band, so maybe I should introduce myself sometimes. But, you know, I'll let Keith t- take over because you know that might be too hard to handle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll just I, I'll just call you Mr. Ghost. Yeah, it might be the best thing. <laughs> so maybe start like at the beginning, like I was, you know, reading up everything about you. You know, you you you've done like Grammy award winning albums with people like Chicago Toto, Stevie Wonder, Thomas Dolby, Van Halen. Um, you work with HBO Productions, Netflix, Amazon. And the thing, being a synth head like me, um, you know, all the synth drones out there probably listening right now, is that you're instrumental in the development of the DX7, which if anybody's a big synth head, we know what that is in terms of FM synthesis, in terms of the patch design and, um, you know, wherever where you want to start. But I think, you know, I think when I send you the questions, like I, I start with most of the people I talk to, I talk about like, when did you get, become interested in music? Like, what age did you get interested in how to kind of seg to where you are now? Right. Um, I, you know, I've been doing this for 35 years and, uh, and it's been a long road, but I was, uh, fortunate enough, I guess, in the right places at the right time or doing the right things. But one of the biggest things I think that kicked my career off is when we first started programming the, the DX7, um, I was one of like four people on the entire planet that could program it. And there's a story about how that all came to be. But um, yeah, let's start with, uh, okay. So um, I'm primary, primarily a keyboardist um, and a horn player. Uh, and when I was growing up, my mom had to hold a ruler over my hands that so that I would practice music. And it wasn't until I uh, found a buddy that turned me on to some like big band jazz and uh, things like that. Um, I played second trumpet and uh, a big band that was led by uh, uh, Jim Schumacher from uh the tommy the new tommy dorsey orchestra obviously and um i was like one of the youngest members there and um there was this competition Uh, i think it was done by i don't know if any of you guys remember downbeat magazine yeah i remember i I used to pick that up well when they used to have magazines at the store (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's all virtual but yeah, that and Keyboard Magazine, I one one I would pick up with Rolling Stones and everything. So I wrote this little uh, kind of Jeff Lorber fusion uh, piece. Interesting fact about Jeff Lorber fusion. Um, in later years, he became a good friend of mine. But do you know who his sax player was? No, no, I don't. His name was Kenny Gorlick. Oh, Kenny G? Kenny G. <laughs> B- before he was Kenny G. <laughs> before he realized that maybe he should cut it down because that's the way you do it in showbiz, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I wrote this. I wrote this little jazz ditty and um, ended up winning um, the Downbeat Award. And uh, so that opened doors because you got that? 
Um, no, it made things a little more complex because it was it was just enough money that made me want to go, and it was just not enough money to really to keep me there. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a difficult thing, but um, I'll tell you a little story about that. At the time, I was playing in a, uh, uh, a rock fusion band. We had three horns. Mm -hmm. Actually, I played horn and keyboards at the same time. Wow. And, um, like yeah. a trumpet or a sax? A uh, trumpet. Trumpet, yeah. And then we had a sax player um, and a bone player. Mm. So... Um, you can imagine we were doing Earth, Wind, and Fire and things like this. All right. That's awesome. Put that aside for a second. Now, uh, when I won uh, the Downbeat Award, I had to go to Chicago to the Blackstone uh, Theater mm -hmm. to accept my scholarship and my award. And it just so happened that the ceremony is on a night that I was doing a, um, a college mixer down in Bloomington, Illinois which is like two and a half hours away. So literally, I went in the room, grabbed my award, ran out, changed <laughs> out of my, you know, my black and blues. And, um, and as I was coming out of the, the bathroom, I literally ran into this guy and i'm like oh i'm so sorry i'm so sorry and he goes no problem no problem and my friend john that was with me he goes do you know who that was and uh well, anyway it's a long story but um we can probably move on from there yeah so i guess we'll say into that at some point <laughs> but um yeah so you've been you've been working on it since you were you know in your schooling days and then yeah. what i wanted to know is like like you were on, on horns you're on acoustic instruments what made you want to get into electronic instruments um well i was working in uh well a lot of the music that i was listening to uh ha um uh, you know like heavy weather and um and uh you know, a lot of the jazz fusion groups that were in the 70s and, um, and Chick Corea and things like that, of course. Sun Ra, well, I'm in this. So <laughs> I went I went to uh, uh, to Berkeley <laughs> for a short time. And then I got another scholarship while I was there. And I ended up at the University of Chicago. So, um, and there's plenty of stories there. But I studied under the tutelage of Dr. John Chowning, who was the inventor of FM um, synthesis. Um, did you pick his course because of that? Or you just kind of, how did you fall into No, I, I picked it because of that. Because I had already been programming the fm synthesizer um i would work like i said i worked in a music store oh so and uh, access to it so you have access to gear even if you're broke yeah that you work in that guitar center <laughs> so you can buy yeah. your marshall stack for your band <laughs> yeah <laughs> the um i guess the 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 that was the biggest blessing was actually not staying at berkeley and uh going to the university of chicago um the first year i was at the university of chicago um okay great little tale um uh, my dorm room was the size of most people's closets <laughs> but it was just one person so i didn't have to share it with anybody right that might be a good thing <laughs> but it was the only dorm room. And yeah, these buildings were built back in the whatever, you know, old days, old days, yeah. early 1800s or whatever. Um, it was the only room 
where if you opened my window, you could crawl out on the roof, which was like a castle, you know. <laughs> That's cool. So I out. had a lot of guys coming in there so they could hang out and do do what, what I figured they were doing. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Hey Kev, can we get through your window? <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. Do. Going up and doing a little of the ganji and uh, yeah. you know, drinking a few beers. Well, one night I I, I uh Yamaha was having an open stage night. Well, I had done a bunch of material, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of to demo off all the fancy stuff. And I'd written some things. And um, most of my friends on my floor, they knew all about all this. So they go, man, it's an open stage night. It was a Friday night, kind of like tonight. <laughs> and... Um, they said, come on, man, come on, man. You got to go. You got to go. And I, and I may have part took in a, well, maybe it was just being in the room. I don't know. Yeah. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at this point I'm 19 years old, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so finally I said, fine, I'll go over to, uh, I can't remember Whitecliff hall or whatever it was. And, um, and uh, fine, I'll see if they'll take me. So I grabbed my little briefcase full of five and a half or five and three quarter inch floppy disks. And oh, they can load it on it. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. This is old school, dude. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no cell phones, no internet. So, yeah, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> so I went over there and they let me on stage. And of course, Yama had all their gear there in all its glory. And I'm like, well, I know how to use this. <laughs> so what was there? What did they actually have? Um, they had a TX-816, hmm. um, which is eight DX-7s in a rack. That's awesome. I would, I would then, love something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was, it was power, man. I would actually probably um, like that better than the DX-7. I used to have that. <laughs> Yeah, well, every horn patch that I ever created sounded huge with the 816, but um, I did a remake of uh, um, uh, St. Elmo's Fire. Oh, okay. I know that. And uh, lots of strings, lots of horns, piano, etc. And uh, anyway, I got up there and did about four or five songs. You know, and I just flew through everything because actually I had the same rig at the music store that I worked for. What kind so of I just was it? What kind of was it? Like a DX7 type of keyboard or a DX1? KX uh, KX88. Yeah. So a controller for the rack. Uh, yeah, for the rack, a QX1 sequencer. Um, was that all MIDI? Or was that not MIDI? The QX1? I mean, all the controllers, are those, were those MIDI controllers or were those like uh, pro, uh, proprietary connector type stuff? No, it was, it was all straight up pretty generic MIDI. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, I did my thing. Uh, when I got off stage, um, I recognized this person, but... Um, didn't know who they were and uh, they asked me if I wanted to go to dinner <laughs> and the long and short of it is how would you like to live in Los Angeles and so began my trails with uh, <laughs> Yamaha so, so you got picked up at a like like the way like uh like uh, I guess um Buffalo Springfield was playing like in LA and they got picked up by you know, people like they were looking for bands. So somebody was looking for somebody like you and they found you. Yeah. I don't know if they were looking or whatever, but uh, maybe they were hoping. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, you know, it was just an open stage night and, yeah. um, and uh, you know, they were promoting their gear and um, you know, and I also um, 
studying under at the University of Chicago. I am very lucky to have studied under Suzanne Siani and also Wendy Carlos. Oh, Wendy Carlos, like Moog, Moog fame. Yeah. Big yeah. Moog. So it was a big Moog fan. So <laughs> it was it was one of these things where I I I just felt I made the right decision. But that yeah. starts the next part of the tale. Did you want to? <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to get long winded on you. No, no, that's cool. I mean, because like, like, so you had your foot in the door into FM synthesis by the guru, the guy who kind of invent they invented it. You're hanging out with Wendy Carlos, who's like a Moog, famous Moog head. Um, and uh, you know, I'm a big, you know, I've got like three Moogs that I use in my room behind me right now. <laughs> um, but it's like, it's interesting. That, that you, you know, you, Berkeley was where everybody probably wants to go. And then you went to Chicago and then you found this other path. And then Yamaha found you. And so maybe you can kind of take off there. Like, where did you start? What what type of bo machines were you working on at Yamaha first? Um. Well, first they brought me in and there's this like little secret lab down in the basement. It's not really secret, but... We like to call it our secret lab. Yes. And um, they took me down there, asked me to do a couple songs for them. Then, um, then they said, show us these patches. And so Gary Lewenberger and I um, uh, can't remember who else was there. Uh, 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 Mark Koning, uh, some the product leaders um, for the DX products. They said, what is this? And it, it's like I had all sorts of crazy stuff. I had uh, patches that sounded just like the Chicago horns, which is a story that we can get to later. Um, you know, I had, well some of the most beautiful electric pianos and stuff like that. And they go, you programmed all this. This is nuts. Oh, I also had this patch where you could press every octave on the DX seven mm -hmm. and it would say, I am a DX seven. I, oh, I, remember, I, I remember seeing that at the store. <laughs> did you get to see that? I think I saw that. I think I could have sworn somebody showed me that one time back in the day. I, I mean, I it's totally that. useless, but I it know. just goes to show that if you can control the formants um, in a yeah. sound. Um, I do remember seeing that in a guitar center or something. I remember seeing it. Yeah. Picture. Yeah. Some of my patches got way around. and I would give out like banks to. Um... Well, anyway, so I started traveling. Um initially uh, just traveling doing uh shows i designed nam shows um let me step back a little bit like how did you get so comfortable with the dx7 architecture was it because you had studied under a, you know someone who had designed fm synthesis that you naturally took what you learned and were able to really understand the dx7 like did you really like totally just get the dx7 and that's why you could do what you were doing i'd love to say that was the easy answer but that's not really what happened i mean a lot of what dr john chowning showed me was all the technical data mm -hmm. you know i mean one of the most important things about programming anything um that is a synthesis device right not a subtractive synthesis you know but a true synthesizer um is knowing the instrument that you're heading for yep. and and um because at the end of the day you can have the most beautiful bosendorfer piano and i've got a beautiful one here in my nord stage three but when you go to record it, unless you're just recording that piano, <laughs> you're going to butcher it by the time you're done in production. 
you know, you're going to get rid of these frequencies so that the bass doesn't over resonate or it gets out of the way of the vocals, you know. And um, so, yeah, I mean, if you heard most pianos in major mixes, they sound thin and weak. Is it because they just EQ and cue them out? Because they, well, they, like they just have to to get everything else to fit in the mix. In, and this is something I, I learned a while back, but I, I, I never really thought of it about it because I would just lay down tracks and tracks and tracks and tracks, right? And then just try to mix them with volume, right? Yeah. Then I realized, hey, the bass is getting in my way, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I either pull down the bass and leave the piano where it's at, and that sounds weird. So you know, I learned I had to cut those frequencies or use a dynamic, um, you know, EQ compressor or something to, to when the bass kicks in, you pull those piano frequencies down, right? Let yeah. them back up, you yeah. know? Um, this was a whole brand new world for me, um, working in the studio with some of these guys um, at Yamaha. So, but in, in any synthesis, it's important that you understand that you have to know what you're looking for, yeah. right? And if you go, I'm going after a flute sound or I'm going after this. Well, anybody can pull up a sine wave and create a flute sound and throw a bunch of reverb on it. and Maybe it'll pass with the right envelope. But what I realized is that in everything we do, and this didn't even become popular until like the 90s. Mm -hmm. In everything we do, um, there's stuff. <laughs> and what I mean is there's stuff. There's fingers yeah, squeaking yeah, across yeah. the fretboard. Yeah. There's and um there's uh, there's chips in the in the flute that um that may be I, uh, somewhat yeah. random. Yeah, I think yeah. what I what I've learned over time is um, I, I I think I told you before I don't use a DAW. I, I use hardware recorders. I use like task cams and stuff because I like to capture, you know, my Moogs and my analog stuff, like with their full full breadth of their signal, and I don't like cutting them down because I like what they sound like naturally. Kind of like like you were talking about the piano and people kind of edit it out. I'm the kind of guy like I want to hear that whole thing, and I might and, focus and, on that. And that's totally cool because that type of recording gives you more of a live, natural yeah. feel. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you want a more produced, kind of, yeah. kind of track that sounds smooth and you know all that, then yeah, you're. It's inevitable. <laughs> Well, it seems like today in the DAW, everybody's looking for the perfect, beautiful sound, right? And 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 I think part of it, what you're saying is like, if you're going to design a guitar, you should understand how a guitar player plays, how he slides the fretboard, how he modulates, how he bends the notes. You know, you look yes. At that Hendrix, you Before you that even go it. about trying to create yeah. it, and yeah. even if I gave you the best horn patch in the world, I watched people take feels one of my crowning achievements is my Chicago horns and um, which by the way was on I think my second Grammy album um, Chicago 17 uh, 25 or 6 to 4 the remake the big huge you know with all the horns and uh, Robert Lamb was talking to me and he goes I want something that will fatten up our three horn players, you know, make it sound bigger than life. Like we added like three more. <laughs> Four more. <laughs> yeah. It was a little more complex than that, but, um, um, I ended up doing that, uh, to back up the horns, you know, um, you know, they're front in the mix, but, uh, anyway, so my point was you can give somebody a great guitar patch. You can give somebody a great uh, horn patch or whatever, 
But if you don't know how to play the instrument, or at least haven't studied how the instrument is played, mm-hmm. um, then there's a very good chance that you're not going to sound like a horn, <laughs> you know, or a guitar. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you want to listen to like like a great, you know, fact, you know, I'm going to listen to Coltrane or I'm going to listen to Sun Ra. I'm going to listen to some really good jazz, right? I might right. listen to like jazz and silhouette by Sunrise, like a great bebop classic, and listen to the how the how the saxes and the horns are on that record, and even the piano on the record. Like if I want to design something, you know, on my Moog, and I'm trying to emulate that. I'm kind of going for what I heard, you know, in that in that sound. I and mean, I play I play a woodwind. I play a clarinet. So I have an understanding of how you use a reed. I oh, really? A, I, yeah, yeah. I started on a clarinet. I've got a, a WX5 up here. I do all my horn lines with uh, a MIDI wind instrument. Yeah, I've, I've been wanting one of those for a long time because I've, I've been wanting or incorporate my clarinet playing, and I never, I really never mic'd my clarinet because I didn't, it didn't really come out good. Um, so I figured, like, one day I want to get one of these wind controllers and actually do wind parts in the way that a clarinet can do it. And the fact that I could also mimic other horns with that with that with that controller i think what you're saying is it's cool to actually have the controller that's really more like the real instrument so then you can actually do the trills and you can do the what you need to do with the reed and the breathing and everything exactly the reed and and i think that's one of the biggest thing i love about wind controllers is that it demands out of me as a performer to breathe (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but the realness in it. I mean, that's kind of like having the fretboard and actually being able to, you know, a keyboard can't really replicate the fretboard. It can try and do things to make it. Right, really. right. But, but it's not the same as what you can do on a real guitar, you know. Well, I'm talking about phrasing. Yeah, right? or even yeah, phrase, the phrasing on if a horn. I'm gonna, if I'm going to take a solo on a sax or, um, you know, whatever it is, I a horn that I have programmed that and i'm using the wind controller there is one inevitable thing i will run out of air <laughs> yeah yeah but it's like there's a whole technique and like the breathing is like if you're playing on the keys you never have that problem and so right you don't no play, yeah you can go you all day long and but then that does the limitation i think this is the thing that's interesting why i've always tell people limitations in music actually make the music right and so the limitation of a of a of a wind player is their breath they can't be infinite breath, right? right? So you have to phrase things in a way that a human being would have to do it because they can't, can't just keep I, on doing I it. I think that's a big part of expression. I mean, our yeah. humanity going into the instrument is is part of expression, and I think that's what makes the most beautiful music. But, you know. Yeah, I, I agree with that. because I think that's, that's why, you know, I like, you know, kind of lo-fi uh, acoustic type of performance where I'm going to do something, you know, with some of my instruments, I'm going to probably use my Moog to, to, to get something that feels kind of authentic and, you know, it feels more human than if I was going to go in and do something off of one of my digital synths, because I'm trying to get some kind of feel that that's like more random. It's like more ha- haphazard because it's like point in time. A lot of stuff I do on my Moog is point in time, and it's hard to capture again. And and that in, in itself is the beauty of it. Is that, that is the beauty of it. Yeah. That's what I like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, uh, no, I have a little, just a little handheld Tascam four track recorder. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really a field recorder, but it does four tracks, and you can bounce tracks and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I've seen those before. Got a couple mics on it. And, um, I'll just grab it, my Columba, and go for a walk. And because I always thought to myself, you know, what would happen if the world turned into dystopia and there were no more synthesizers and <laughs> no more DAWs? Oh, by the way, talking about DAWs, it doesn't matter uh, what you get. Um, but man, you know, I love acoustic guitar players. 
because they can just strap on an acoustic guitar and just make their own entertainment wherever they go. I'm it's a little more difficult for me, but yeah. um, <laughs> yeah. but well, um, let's get one of these, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll find a good old hollow log and beat it with a stick, lay down a beat, then I move over to the next track. I can just take a recorder, you know, and just play with what well, was like breathing, you know, a little recorder with the keys on it, you know. It's, it's like any kind of wind I like having because then, you know, then you can play wherever you want to play, you know, if, if you feel that kind of jazz mood, you know, but that, that, that's always cool to have acoustic instruments to do that. Ah, I just remembered something. In the back, of, I can't remember what the magazine was. It was probably some weird old comic book or something or something like that. When I was a little boy. Do you uh, remember Paya? I think they're still around actually building parts and stuff. Mm. Uh, Paya Electronics. What did they make? What kind of, what did, like what kind of kits? They made, they made like, kits? Like, yeah, like, electronic kits and stuff like that like for music. Where you could like build, build like what, little synthesizers or something, build oscillators? Yeah, a little mono thing that runs on battery, right? Mm, and, like uh, and so, but there's a picture in the back. I'm man, I'm, I was probably less than 10. There was a picture of a guy sitting in a tree making music. He's just in a tree with that, with something he built, or he just in the tree? He, he, <laughs> he put the kit together, he's in the tree using it. Like battery yeah power. yeah it was battery powered so he had just had a pair of headphones on and a little keyboard and doing his little thing that sounds like 70s i remember radio shack i used to go to radio shack and they had a bunch of like do-it-yourself kind of oscillator kit type things and um and i think mode made the work stat you could like, build it from scratch yeah you that's right a single yeah. oscillator kit and you could put, put it together and build your own synth but um yeah, I think it's cool to, you know, that's what I kind of did with my Eurorack. <clears throat> I got into Eurorack like four years ago, and I like the idea that you could just go buy modules from anybody and then kind of build your synth the way you want, right? You can build your, find your control unit, find your oscillators, find, just pick, you know, you go on the net and you just pick and you read up stuff and say, well, I'm going to get my oscillator from this company. I'm going to get my envelopes from this company. I'm going to get all my other stuff and, and you just kind of slap it together and like, well, well whether or not it's really going to work as good as like a Roland <laughs> or a Yamaha that it, it, it's all monophonic anyway. It's not polyphonic, but, um, right. But, but it just gives you this feeling that like, this is mine, right. That you built yeah. it and it's yours and, and because it's yours, you can do whatever you want with it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to get into, uh, hopefully we're going to have, um, another session that um where we'll be able to um get into some of the the techie head stuff oh yeah we can definitely dive into that now we still got like a half hour to go um <laughs> yeah well you also got a huge list of questions in front of me so. uh, yeah well, we kind of bounce around with what we what it comes into like mind um so if you want to go deep so into where the, where where are we at well, we're at, I kind of asked about going to school and, and, and like you're working with the inventor part of you um, where you kind of came up with this idea of building patches. But maybe you want to talk more about the inventor side of your work and beyond patches, what type of inventions you actually have come up with within synthesis. Well, the original breath controller um, for the DX7 I put in, uh, I think my first touch upon this was um, while I was working at Yamaha, but I, I'm going to take a divergence here from you. Um, uh, I'm going to tell you what happened next. So I'm on the road and I'm doing these, all these product clinics, right? And doing these shows. And there were two big shows every year of NAM one in anaheim and the other fluctuated in the midwest i think between chicago and uh, atlanta and uh boy 
Um, so I don't know, about a year into working for Yamaha, you know, I'm basically flying all over the place uh, every week. Every other day I'm on a plane, you know. Well, I get this call um, from my coordinator. And she says, we're pulling you off the road. Um, be here next week in uh, Buena Park. And I said, okay. Uh, maybe I can get some rest. <laughs> yeah, that being a road player is not cool. Unless yeah, you like, I was, unless you like it, maybe you like it, maybe you don't. <laughs> well, you can love it, but after time, <laughs> well, you, 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 like eating restaurant food every day might sound good until you do it too many times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yamaha was never stingy. I mean, uh, they were, and this was the eighties. This was a very prosperous time in America. We have a low budget. You're not doing the Holiday Inn. <laughs> yeah yeah i think i stayed in one holiday inn and i was like what holiday inn <laughs> most of the time i stayed at marriott's so yeah i just remember but, the who the who wrecking holiday inns. that's what i remember <laughs> <laughs> we um so i i i got pulled into the office and uh it was toto that oh, yeah was having difficulty programming the DX7. <laughs> Imagine that. The doggone thing was more complex with a little tiny window to read everything. And hey, even if you bought one of those big screens, it didn't really help you much. Um, it's so. Uh, a lot of people just use the base patches because it was like so hard for some people to figure out well nobody do. used anything but the base patches unless they bought some or if they were lucky enough to uh find some store technician that wasn't hogging them and and grab a couple banks from me but um that was uh very interesting so and this was supposed to be a one-time thing and it didn't end up being a one-time thing. It ended up that every artist relation, you know, cause Yamaha would give people gear as long as they show the Yamaha name oh, when, when they play, playing, when they play. So if they're in the video or they're on and, stage and they give it credit it. on the, yeah. On the so if you did, then they give you the gear. Yeah, they just gave the gear. Um, so here's David Page and Steve Picaro, who, by the way, are going to be uh, uh, Steve is going to be a guest on my channel here in the next uh, couple of months. Yeah, maybe announce that you're you're actually going to be launching your channel, right? Yeah, I'll. I'll, I'll, I'll... So here's what happened. <laughs> there was a beefier version of the DX7. And by beefy, I mean like it had a lot more modulation options, a lot of different things, but it was phenomenally expensive to build. That model number was which one? Uh, well, it started with the non-programmable version, which was called the GS1. GS1 which basically looked like a big wooden box <laughs> looked more like a piano than it did anything. And it really didn't have any controls. Is it kind of um, like a CS 80 kind of form? No, nah, CS 80 had tons of knobs and whistles yeah, and it, bells, it you know, had the wood had the wood of it, but it didn't have the controls. Yeah. It had the wood of it, but it had zero controls. So um, now I'll I'll tell you I'll tell you a story here that um, probably not many people uh, know, and uh, certainly nobody outside the industry. So when I got into the room and was working with uh, Picaro and Page, um, here's what we had to do: we used a regular DX7. And then we had a list on a piece of paper of all of these other parameters 
right? That the GS1 could do. And so I would take <laughs> a blind drunken guess <laughs> at some of these parameters. And so we'd ship that information over to Japan. They would turn around, program it, and ship an entire new GS1 to us. This thing weighed like 400 pounds. I don't know. It was yeah, those huge. were big, heavy machines back. You know, all these machines back then were like hard to break, break your back. <laughs> now we did this. Um, we did this like three times. <laughs> So the did, cost yeah, like a, <laughs> the cost was enormous so on you know the third time did you feel like you weren't making those those guesses yes you know actually by the second time i went oh i know exactly where that's coming from or i know exactly what that is and my friend those are the sounds that you hear on um the africa track yeah, those are phenomenal. That's I think that made a lot of people. I remember when I first heard like what I always wanted to know what synthesizer was doing what back in the day, and then I heard like what's this BX7? Because I had kind of grown up, you know, with Hammond B3s, Mo Mini Moogs, you know, you know DC3s, uh, Prophet Fives, Jupiter Eights. Yeah, the CS80 got yeah, CS80. got munched in there too. Yeah, in the so, CS80s, but but it's just like when but I heard the, the, the yeah. lead sounds are what I uh just the lead sounds are the marimba and the flute. Um yeah, I think the precision of these kind of percussive metallic sounds and, and more orchestral sounds that actually sounded like the instrument, you know. And I think that's what made people at least I back in the day, I was very impressed with the way the DX7 had that ability. To, to do the digital sounds and it really kind of set aside <clears throat> between the analog world and the digital world. You started to see, well, why would you want a digital synth? And, it, and you, you started to say, well, wow, I can get these pianos, I can get these electric pianos, I can get these flutes, I can do these kind of percussive sounds. And, you know, I, I yeah, think a, a great addition to any DX7 would be an Oberheim uh, or a. Uh, Huh. A profit five, maybe? Um, profit five, yeah. That's what I was thinking. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, cause I, those are the big, like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a Jupiter 8 guy, but I, I do I do recognize the profit five was used as heavy as the Jupiter. Um, and some people like one or the other, but I kind of like both. But um, yeah, I just like the, the pad, the kind of analog pad sound that it, it's not really like trying to be like a real instrument it's kind of its own thing um, yeah. yeah and that's what i like about it um it's not trying to be a violin it's not trying to be a horn it's kind of its own right weird version of it um like the way the lead on a moog isn't really like anything that you've ever heard it's it's a moog <laughs> it's a moog yeah, yeah it's, it's like if, if you get a bukla like a bukla is a bukla you hear yep. a bukla you, you can't like, beat wow. that ladder filter yeah, you can try to simulate it, but you can't beat it. Yeah, as if when the resonance dropped off the bass. <laughs> it's like, what happened? It's like, oh, I got to get a state variable filter and, and not lose it. Um, but, um, <laughs> My original mini Moog. I was lucky because um, I got one of the last of the lines, so I had the most stable oscillators. Oh, yeah, they got really stable near the end. They got yeah. more temperature controlled, where the ones that weren't temperature controlled would go crazy if you had them out, like, on the road. <laughs> oh, it took it a half hour, warm up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, I've seen buddies that go just curse it because for it then when it gets hot, <laughs> you got to retune it again. It's like, okay, I drop it in, and now I dropped out. It's like, bye. It's like, the boat says I'm done. I'm done for the day. <laughs> Doesn't matter what you want to do, I'm done. Yeah, <laughs> they got their own personality. Like, it's like my dog or my cat. It's like, hey, I'm done. 
you you can do what you want, but I'm done. <laughs> oh man, this is this has been a fun evening with you. I hope we get to do a little bit more. There's a oh, ton yeah, yeah, more to yeah. talk about, but yeah, we um, go, yeah. Well, we, we but, can, I said we can go like a, a like an hour fifteen. You know. Okay. Want, Great. So, together. where do I take off from here now? <laughs> well, like we were talking about, like how you got into your inventor stage, and you kind of talked about how you you hooked up the breath controller or the be able to do that oh. type of thing, and then you kind of segged into other things. Because I was asking you about your inventor stage, and we talked about like how you came to work for Yamaha. We talked about your FM synthesis, um, but we may want to talk about because there's a lot of name checking we did before. But I mean, you you. How did you come to work with people like Quincy Jones, Janet Jackson? You talked about Toto, and we heard that. And we yeah. talked and Stevie Nicks and Eddie Van Halen. And Once I came off the road from uh, doing the product specialist gig, mm -hmm. um, then basically all my duties were was to work with the artists and... Um, was that a specific and, do, and do the two NAM shows every year, you know, design and set them up. In? I'm sorry. Did they, did they put you in a department that was like to work with the artist? Was that called a certain type of department? Yeah. Artist relations. <laughs> if you're in artist relations, but from a technical standpoint, right? Well, from a technical standpoint, I was still under Tom Weber and Phil Moon and uh, my coordinator, Kim Swanson. So, and yeah, I, and I worked with the same group that I'd been working with, you know. So, but then I added Doug Butterfield um, and uh, Sasha. I can't remember her last name. But anyway, uh, they were in charge of artist relations. Mm -hmm. And that was keep the artists happy, right? So oh, I became yeah. their... Uh, how to keep them happy but like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but it's like are you primarily working on them when they're working with them when they're working on an album or working with them on when they have to go tour or is like it didn't matter it's like a little bit whatever they need it so after a year or so in this new role what i would do is i would go into the studio sessions where I needed to be. So I worked with the artist probably for, I don't know, three months. Okay. And I wouldn't be with just one artist. I'd be bouncing around from, anyway, uh, the list goes on and on. Um, but uh, I would spend a few months with each artist. And then I would jump on the road with them to make sure everything went perfect. And once I felt that, you know, things were cool, then I jumped back off the road and went right back into the studio with so another wait, artist. Did, so do you have did I, do you have to kind of do a knowledge transfer with the artist like road people so they could learn to do what you do so you could be replaced so you could actually go work with somebody else? Uh, yeah and uh, let's take van halen for example um i jumped in the studio with edward and um he had a key tech right that traveled with him anyway um so yeah he was there every minute of everything i did looked over my shoulder asked questions i mean i gave him every yeah, thing i could and then when we were out on tour for oh you know i think it was only two months um he goes i get it you know i see where the little <laughs> Or to knock the jukebox on the side and, and you know and do that kind of thing, but um, yeah. So what? Yeah, when they when they feel comfortable with their rig, because yeah, nobody's yeah. all the same. Yeah, everybody's different, but how they want to yeah. approach. It. But what's cool is like it's cool that you weren't didn't get pigeonholed to, to stay with any one group and become they become so dependent on you that you couldn't go work with other people. 
I think Dude, it's really I cool. went I from Van Halen to Barry Manilow. Yeah, but I think it's really cool <laughs> that, that you didn't make yourself like so indispensable that you got stuck with them like one group. You know, that you were able to well get now Did you have there, a strategy is, for that? there is a moment. And I still wonder to this day if I if I had made a different decision, how my life would have turned out. So um Stevie Wonder asked to see the new DX7. And um what year was and, that? Which which, uh, which new one was it? It was the DX7 II. Um, FD, you know, floppy drive. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's cool. I remember those. Um, so here was my great pleasure. We were in the middle of a NAM show. People, noise everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And um, my division manager said, Kevin, you're probably the best person to show Stevie what's cool, what's happening. Of course, the DX7 I was standing at had all my patches in it. <laughs> you know, no stock shit for me. But anyway, I'm like, um, dude, my heart was beating out of my chest. Here standing next to me is Stevie Wonder. And, <laughs> and I... I took his hand. He literally asked me to take his hand and show him what each button on the front panel did. Oh, wow. And he got it like right away. So here we are with hundreds, maybe thousands of people swarming around. Right. <laughs> and here him and I are in our own little headphone world. <laughs> And then I started listening to Stevie play my patches. Well, that must have been amazing because he has such a touch on the board. Yeah, yeah. I almost pooped myself. <laughs> um, I, I can see that. I mean, so, you know, what a wonderful time. I spent maybe a half hour with him and he said thank you and it went away. And um, the next morning, you know, I'm there early before they open the gates and do all this other stuff. And um, Stevie's tour manager came up to me and said uh, that he wants me to go on his tour. We're starting in Japan. That's not a bad place to start. <laughs> well, you got to understand, I'm a young kid now. By the way, Yamaha hired me when I was only 20 years old. That's awesome. <laughs> and um and so i made because i was working with so many different artists and getting exposed to so many different things i said no to stevie wonder <laughs> wow that's crazy i know but you know what it's okay because you want, you did, it was it that you didn't want to travel at that time no, 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 no. It's just that I thought my opportunities were better instead of being his key tech, right? Yeah, yeah, you could be more or something else. And I can do more things and not get pigeonholed, like you were saying. Yeah, yeah, because that's what I was wondering, because that, that was the beginning of the question. Like, if you get put into that situation too many times, then you might just get known as a key tech rather than what you became known for. Yeah. And good, little did I know, but uh, <laughs> little did I know, but um, there was going to be something that grabbed my heart. And I knew there was something about it. I watched this PBS special when I was a young man and uh, they showed the movie Jaws yeah, yeah. and the opening scene with and without John Williams music in it. Oh, yeah, John Williams. And the scene was horrible without the music. It di didn't music make suspense. It didn't invoke emotion. And I realized the power in writing scores. Scores are and like so, everything. I mean, Star Wars, what Star Wars without 
kind of what with what that music. The yeah, those Star- beautiful French horns. <laughs> yeah, she didn't, she didn't have that 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 whole symphonic thing going on. Would it be as impressive? Probably not. Right, and I anyway. Uh, that slowly leaked in next. So, uh, I mean, you can ask me about everybody. Oh, um, Quincy Jones. Yeah, he's a big, um, he's a big one. <laughs> I know, I digress. Uh, <laughs> well, that's a good place um, to continue. <laughs> I was in the, um, um, oh, good grief, Burbank Studios. And it was Janet Jackson's first, her first album. And um, that is the self-titled one. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Um. So anyway, I was just supposedly just taking a tour of the studio, right? Sorry about that. And um, and uh, we walk in the door. And there's only one person in the room. And that was Quincy Jones. Now, he gave me an awful lot of good life advice that evening. I think we stayed there until one or two in the morning and we were listening to one of Janet Jackson's tracks. I, by the way, I didn't play on the album or do anything for it, but um, it, it's important in my life because he bought a boom box, a Kmart. It sat in the back of the room. And so he would literally mix dump it to the cassette, take the cassette, listen to it in the boom box. Some cheap, you know, yeah, $30 yeah. boom box. So you can play and he'd the pull car. the tape and he said, come on, come with me. And we'd get in his car and he'd pop the cassette in his car and he'd listen to it on his own speakers, right? I think it's a great thing to do. <clears throat> I, back in the day, you know, when I had my task cam, <clears throat> I would dump it down to a boom box. I, I go and I do a little cheesy master <clears throat> of dumping it down and then take it and put it into my little Nissan, you know, two seater and then drive it down, down the road to see, well, how does this sound like for real? You know, so that's, I think that's it, a good. Technique. It's invaluable if you're, you know, and I knew about listening to reference material. I use uh, Steely Dan um, uh, for, my reference material and um your favorite you you do actually know don donald vega right okay once again here's another artist i didn't work with but i did a photo shoot with him does that count (laughs) you actually got to hang with him a little bit but he did tell me some stories while we were hanging out Uh, but anywho um yeah i mean i saw the value in first of all you can have $300 $300 million monitors. Yeah, yeah. But if you burn it to a CD or grab the MP3 and take it to your car or take it to a boombox or listen to it on your phone mm-hmm. and then tell yourself, okay, I understand the limitations of the device, but do I have a clear, even mix? Yeah, you and get a good picture of it. Then you know you're headed in the right direction. You know, yeah, you gotta take like 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 <clears throat> some instead of waiting for months and months to get to the final master, it's sometimes good to see, you know, is this kicking or not? <laughs> the kind of short firm is it, yeah, does well, it kick or does it not kick? <laughs> by like, that yeah. time, you know, the, you know, at least your mastering engineer, or if you're the mastering engineer, you're not trying to polish a turd. It's good to run it through the cycle a few times i mean what i watched quincy jones do it three times for one song until he goes all right that'll work for now 
<laughs> I think it's cool to do that because I think I, I kind of like what I kind of grew up doing because this maybe because of necessity that's what I did because of the gear I had. Um, but you know, I, I didn't want to go and over. I make so many different variations of the tracks I do that sometimes I want to see before I destroy my track by doing like too many overdubs. Maybe I should check it at like four overdubs and see whether or not I should keep on going. Because I think sometimes you, you find that like if you do too many just because you can, then maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> a diminishing return is what we call it. It happens yeah. after a singer also sings too many times tries to do too many retakes retakes yeah yeah diminishing return it's closer to the first three or four than than the like the last 50. <laughs> <laughs> i would i would think even the honesty of the take right like the honesty of what the song was about right yeah and i mean that's in danger whenever you overdo it yeah sometimes it's better to walk away and come back another day you know yeah that's what i find sometimes I've, I've had like people you know they did a voice memo recording of a song right for their vocal and then they go spend all this time right. with better, better microphones better this better that but it's actually the delivery of that first voice memo was so honest and so good i'd rather try to eq that and use that and so what they did before what they did i've, after, been, they did I've been guilty of that too is a cat trying to capture the emotion not necessarily the quality yeah, yeah. sometimes they, that you know you know in certain places you you, you can do that in the indie kind of all, all world college radio world where you're trying to get like the authenticity of it um that's kind of like where i live but yeah we're we're at the hour mark if you want to keep on going another 15 minutes we can keep on going well, it's up to you. You're the host, my friend. Yeah, I'm cool. Just, uh, we only cut it down because of our audio partners only want to run 75 minutes. That's what I want. <laughs> but um, we would like to go all night. But that's how they work. Um, <clears throat> so I think one of the other things that's cool since we, we have time on this, this episode is to cover, like, how did you get involved in the Grammy voting committee? Did you get selected? Do you? How do you get... It, it, pick to be on that committee um first you have to have a a sponsee i guess somebody that's already in the academy um and then you have to give them a pallet of work and i mean recent not like stuff you did in the 1930s i mean like oh, so it has to be within the last five years or ten years or yeah and uh, you know whether it's producing engineering is songwriting is it whatever it is well i ended up in the producer and engineering wing and that's okay it's the story of my life <laughs> that's interesting so it sounds like like you're in that wing but you you had aspirations that you wanted to get somewhere else but you ended up in that position so do wow. you have feelings about that in one way or the other First of all, I'm not the greatest lyricist in the world, and I will say that, but I am a good songwriter. And, uh, but perhaps I'm in just the right place. And see, we don't vote for every category. It would be impossible. I mean, come November, mm -hmm. I'm thrashed with CDs and things to listen to and all this stuff. And it's like, I pick only the categories that I feel qualified to vote on. And they allow me to do that. What, do you have a particular category? Uh, is it based on what is coming in or what you really feel? Um, no, is, uh, there's a, a, a dedicated list of categories. Mm -hmm. So like. You stay in that zone. Yeah, just throw something out here i'm not allowed to talk about the categories but um uh, you know like like of course we all know best album and best yeah, yeah. vocalist and all that stuff but um some of these underlying things are like best engineering and and uh best use of an environment and i mean it's yeah. it's, it's crazy stuff but it's like I'd rather spend my time 
judging what I'm good at, not judging whether oh girl or old boy wins the woo woo on Sunday night, you know. <laughs> I get it. Oh, I I'm hoping it. some of these changes that are happening at the Grammy Academy are uh, they're getting rid of the console, the board. Okay. And so our direct votes um go right to the end tally. So you feel like it's gonna be better? I am I'm hoping so. Um and yeah, this whole wave, and I don't want to get into political things, but this whole wave of political correctness, it goes back and forth and all these things. And, and it's so blatantly obvious that there, that someone is filtering at some point, um, because of race and gender. Yeah. And, uh, but I'm looking, uh, possibly to move over to the CMAs. I was a member for a while. I really enjoyed it. Oh, that's cool. It's a different, and, that's a totally different zone. <laughs> yeah. But no, the, the Grammys was something where I, um, first of all, I was invited. And then second, I had to put up the goods or, um, I wasn't in. Mm -hmm. So I had to send my own resume, so to speak, of my music material, my, you know. Well, it's cool. I mean, they, I think it's awesome to, to be in. They, they, just the notoriety of it, whether or not you feel that it, it's just, um, like once you're in it, it might be feel different than what it looks like to people on the outside. <laughs> um, I look at it and say, wow, that's awesome. But you, like, you're inside of it, you can like, well, I don't know. Are you, are you excited about it's, it? It's not just a, it's a, it's hard work, man. It's not, it's not some kind of glossy thing. You actually have to do a lot of work. <clears throat> yeah, I, I've got a, I've got a beautiful plaque from, uh, well, what will be next year, five years ago, uh, thanking <clears throat> my, um, you know, participation so in the producer engineering, but one of the, lovely things about being a part of this wing of the uh, recording academy is that really us tech guys we don't pull any punches there's no politics <laughs> so you're gonna say is, is it good or is it you know some not something not good which i could say you know what it really is <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> you know what i mean you know. It, i think it's like like anybody like in the film industry the technical people to do the special effects or do the sound effects, do the sound engine. They're going to say, is that good? Or was it, you know, it's like, yeah, because you know if it's bad, it's not going to come through. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but, but I'm going to switch gears to a little bit because it's something I think is really cool. And we're going to probably spend more time on it next time. But you are working on this new AI music assistant project. And I don't know how much you can talk about it because you're working on it. But we'd like to, you know, maybe you tell people as much as you can about it. Um, let me take you back to 1986. And I created the, verse, the first voice, voice controlled studio. And it was rudimentary commands. Voice commands did this, you know, start, stop sequencers, rewind, you know, bar ahead, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I never touched that because it never had any understanding. And so for the last two years, I have been working diligently with uh, um, Google TensorFlow and, um, and IBM. And I um, finally ran into some good friends that helped me... Uh, put a little personality on top of it. Um, but uh, she controls a camera in my office. So she's watching my hands. She's listening to my voice. And she knows every piece of gear in my room. Think about a MIDI controller that can MIDI learn, right? Machine learning is the big thing. 
you know. And, and well, once she has it, it's like she takes control of the unit. I mean, she knows she knows more about my P6 uh, controller than probably I do. Um, but I, guess but you said, I think we've talked before, and the problem, I guess, in today's world is there's so much instant gratification to out of the box. Machine learning, you know, we use it in, 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 in um, financial, the financial world and the banking world is using machine learning. And we realize it's like it's not like out of the box going to do it. It's going to has to learn. And I guess accountants are more patient, maybe <laughs> more patient than maybe music people. So we kind of understand it's going to take months for it to understand our product catalog and our setup. But but maybe in a music world, it's hard to get somebody to realize it's not going to give you something like today when you buy it today. <clears throat> yeah, so I I'd love to talk about it. Um, Amy really is. I've quieted her down for this interview, but um, <laughs> um, yeah, that no, we, she, we, we, she we, needs we, to build, You know, she's she's on a uh, an algorithmic reinforced learning method that um she gets to know me how i play how i talk you know and i think that's valuable if you think about that like i think we've talked a little bit right you said like if you are a musician right and you've got this ai person you know you know virtual assistant <laughs> that is sitting there and patient enough and you do a four hour dive session right like i'm a modular synthesis and i've got all my midi signals cc signals going back and forth on my euro rack i'm doing this i'm doing that if she was watching me while i'm doing that and i don't have to go and take the pictures of my cv right she would know what i was doing and she could tell me what I was doing, and maybe she could suggest different things oh, to do. Right? That would be that would be super simple for Amy because Amy's doing things beyond that. Um, we've been developing a database in conjunction um, with uh, IBM, and uh, one thing Amy has learned is how I play bass. And uh, she can mimic me. In other words, if I lay down a piano part and say, Amy, lay down uh, a bass line in the style of me. <laughs> she does a damn good job <laughs> of, cool. of emulating me. So, I so then I, I trained her with, from the IBM uh, laboratory stuff, I trained her with Paul McCartney. Oh wow! So style. it's like, or mimic, mimic okay, Amy, style. lay down a baseline in the style of Paul McCartney, right? Do you and, feel that you can actually lay that down? What she does and use it like in a track you would use? Yeah, it's not. It's not stealing from Paul McCartney for crying out, Pete. He's actually just inspired by his style, and it's not the clone. It's inspired clone. by thousands of his songs okay so right. it's taking like his whole catalog and then figuring out what to do and so it's not any one song it's like all the songs predictive encoding of what he would probably do wow now that 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 that's very valuable i mean that's that's like, like you know back in the day when we had the casio cord and we're like oh this is pretty cool but that's like this is way beyond casio cord but what my goal is, is, you know, and here's my marketing dilemma, of course, and that is you can put these tools in somebody's hand, mm -hmm. but it roughly takes two to three months before, and it doesn't matter what you call it. It, you know, it's a thing. It's not a female or a male or anything like that. You know, I just call my name, you know, well, I think it's the type of person. And I, you know, I, I actually talked with a lot of producers, like indie producers, and, you know, we're kind of in our bedroom producer type mode, right? We spend a lot of hours 
in our own you know world and it's not instant gratification you know we spend a lot of time at our craft and i think it's that type of person that is you know by themselves working on their art right? they could take advantage of a tool like that you know i think it's a person that that is experimenting with all types of things and doesn't feel like they have a lot of boundaries um i think that type of person is going to be the kind of person that would really appreciate what, what you're doing i i see a an entire world of composition where you're collaborating with musicians from and have long since passed away yeah that'd be awesome because if you can take their catalog of material and you can extract what you want out of that yeah, and that's part of what you know i'm also doing because i'd love to give you a like a cartridge track or something that says here's paul mccartney here's i would like to be able to jam with like the velvet underground you know like when See, like, white, and white those white. and in those kind of requests are very possible <laughs> i mean depending on how much material i can you know pull together and feed into the damn box <laughs> there's different periods you got the loaded period where they sounded more more polished you got white light wet white heat it's just total noise you got the first album that's very like you know well crafted low vignettes to these stories and well so you can have, like, right now i'm working on a little bit. groove and individual instruments so would it be possible to get a feel of like a whole band like the way the velvets are because everybody knows what the velvets kind of sound like the kind of lo-fi feel is it more individual instrument or could you get a whole band's feel well i've uh i've steered away from some of the hard things <laughs> give me a break <laughs> um but um i suppose it would what i do is pick out a certain instrument and then pick out a different instrument the same song roll it roll it roll it through and then feed that in and let it grind you know and um after about a hundred songs you uh um and sometimes it was sloppy i mean if you don't do enough inputs yeah. it's sloppy so yeah, but i mean this is the, this is like babies yeah. right? like yeah, like little kids, you can't just slap their face and go, grow up and drive me a car. <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, it's, it's hard to go from like zero to a million miles an hour, you know. I know, but as soon as I tried to do that initially, and um, one of the reasons why actually the AI assistant is actually a side, and I we'll tell you about this i guess uh on another session but yeah. it's actually not the primary not the primary goal no it's part, <laughs> part of the whole picture you got a bigger so that he's got a kevin's got a bigger picture we will talk about it in part two um we have gone a little long but i think it's been really cool they were talking with a guy that's oh yeah what's the, what's that a board from the dx7 <laughs> Or is that the board? Find out next now? time. We'll find out next time. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're very happy to have had had you on the show. Um, we will Thank live streaming, and uh, we'll send you the links. You know, the whole world can see us on our channels, but we'll send you the permanent links um, so you have them. Mr. We'll Ghost, talk. you're the best. Yeah, we'll talk to you again, definitely. Yeah. Okay. I, I would remind you, yeah, we remember your show is starting when? Um, we're, we're looking at probably July at this point. We're, um, we're going to collaborate with you though, right oh, off yeah. the bat. Yeah. So yeah, I'll, I'll be a guest on your show if you want me to come on. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be showing all sorts of crazy, you know, the keyboard techniques and, you know, odd stories. And <laughs> at some point, like, I'm, I wasn't ready to play this time. I guess the only thing I could play is my little OPZ. That's the only thing I can play, which, um,
So it's a little outro of a theme song I built for this for the for this whole thing. Very nice, Keith. I can't get it to do what I want because she was on too long. She had she heated up. <laughs> That's just a little preview. Talk to you later. Thanks.